if i am audible yeah yeah, yeah. please thank you thank you so much sir uh, for those glowing words that you gave uh, spoke about me uh, it is indeed a privilege for me to speak on this platform i would also like to thank the honorable vice chancellor and senior functionaries of the maharashtra university of health sciences for uh, taking out this initiative of mhs learning and it is a wonderful platform where the undergraduates would get to know about a lot of topics i feel dwarfed by my pre, uh, my predecessors dr datarkar and uh, dr uh, janardan garde who spoke very well i would like to do justice to this topic on principles in the management of maxillary uh, maxillofacial trauma uh, in one hour whatever is possible uh, we'll try to squeeze in because this is such a vast topic this is essentially i think after the third molars they should be the bread and butter of most of the maxillofacial surgeons as well as for the dental health professionals who can come across certain cases where they should be able to manage it uh, sometime later in their practice as well as to learn more about it uh, in the uh, uh, for the exams right so uh, what i would like to speak upon is the basic principles of uh, uh, trauma as well as as boyer sir said about uh, the mandible and the mid face also so when we talk about sir so uh, these are the different cases that we get uh, in our practice and one should not be one should not get uh, you know scared about dealing with such cases because if you have the principles in mind i don't think no task is insurmountable for anybody to handle this now uh, we are living in an age of high velocity everything is fast track right fast cars fast bikes we don't have time and um, the very interesting thing is that uh, in the initial 30 days of uh, corona lockdown there were very few cases which we got in our casualty but as soon as uh, the bad thing happened about opening up the liquor shops immediately on that particular day there were 12 cases and now again because it is the unlock has happened there are cases which are coming up by the dozen so it should be kept in mind about the various types of uh, the etiology that can cause it so what basically we see is uh, the different causes which i'll enumerate in my slide later is uh, you got sports incidents you got interpersonal uh, violence you know what you see over here industrial accidents motor vehicle accidents we don't have time we don't wait for the signal so ultimately what is going to happen is that something is going to something and someone is going to get hurt right if we look at the motor vehicle accident if you are in a you are sitting in a car and especially without a seat belt or a airbag what happens is that we are in motion with the car and then when there is braking or sudden deceleration the body tends to get thrown forwards and ultimately that results in fracture of the long bones that is the femur the pelvis and uh, then of course it also uh, hit, uh, the steering wheel hits the sternum and the head goes forward and hits the the windshield so this can cause extensive trauma to the patient and can be sometimes very catastrophic right so this all such things contribute to the increasing its incidence of facial trauma now this is a short video that i'm going to show in which the passenger who's sitting at the back who's not wearing a restraint like a seat belt can cause a very devastating effect on himself as well as the person sitting in front of him so you know this is the sort of thing that can happen i'll play it again actually so this is the sort of thing that can happen in high velocity accidents where even the person sitting at the back can get injured very well uh drastically what happens is what you see over here is a mannequins but then in real life it can happen and we should be cautious as well as advise caution to a lot of people okay so after that what happens is that when we look at the incidents so from this chart which was uh, released by the jay prakash narayan trauma center in delhi aims so this shows that in india this is the highest incidence road traffic accidents cause the maximum number of maxillofacial which is 54% then falls assault industrial accidents and sports right so that is the sort of uh, statistics that we have now what is the mechanism of injury if it is uh, any sort of let us assume that uh, an assault or a fall or an accident is considered as a 
trauma, right? So what can happen is if there is a trauma like this, if there is someone hits a fist, right? What could happen is that it could fracture the mandible at the point of uh, strength that is the intercanine region because the mandible takes an abrupt curvature here. So this is a weak point as well as the nature has made the condylar neck weak so that the condyle can fracture rather than getting impacted in the glenoid fossa. A similar thing happens when the patient falls uh, uh, forward on the ground with the chin hitting it and this is a kind of a motor vehicle accident where you got a bilateral uh, parasympathetic fracture along with the condyle fracture. Now, this is a very dangerous situation because this can pull the tongue backwards. So, this is an emergency and this one should also recollect during your viva if somebody asks you that what is the emergency, why there is an airway embarrassment in mandible, mandibular fracture. So, the cause is a bilateral parasympathetic fracture. The image which you see on the right over here. There is no audio oh, and video, please. Pardon, sir? Am I not, am I not audible? Hello. Hello. Anjana. Ah, okay. 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 Dr. Shenoy, sir, can you he hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Sir, I just got a call from uh, Garde also saying that uh, okay, okay, he can hear. Shall I go ahead? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, I can hear you, sir. So, Basically, if I can uh, move forward, uh, what what the nature has provided is hello. Yes, sir. Sir, no audio, no video. So just I'll just check up. I'll just check. Hello, am I audible? Sir, I can hear you, sir. Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Okay. Sir. Uh, okay. okay sir. Yeah, yeah, Jana. I, 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 you are audible and visible, sir. Okay. There must be some technical problem from OSS, uh, this thing, I think. Okay. okay, okay. So, Jana, just let me know if I stop him because... Yes, I, sir. Yes, sir. I can see you, sir. Okay, fine. I'm there. I'm seeing you, sir. Yeah. So, uh, what the nature has provided uh, is the matchbox frame from what you can see. This is called the matchbox. Uh, this is called the matchbox and uh, the hockey stick frame. Because what happens is that uh, uh, when there is a trauma, when it hits the mid face, like right, the mid face is so, the bones are so fragile that they will fracture. Had they been very firm and rigid, the forces of trauma would have got transmitted to the uh, uh, to the cranium and that would have damaged the brain or the cranial structures. Similarly, if you look at the mandible, what you see over here is. You, this is the anatomic, de the uh, uh, the deficiency which is there, and the neck of the condyle fractures, preventing it from getting impacted into the middle cranial fossa. Also, if you look at it, the mid face forms a angle of forty five degrees to the cranium, so that if there is a trauma, it will get displaced downwards and backwards. So this is the sort of protection mm -hmm. that nature has provided, so that the patient doesn't get hurt so severely that the brain gets damaged. Now, this is an image which I got from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which was a study, uh, from a study that was conducted here. So, this is the extent of the crumple zones that one can see. So, 
when you look at this image you can realize how much of damage there is sir no audio no video can you listen me yes sir i can hear you sir jana hello oh, yes, sir voice oh, yes, sir good afternoon uh, hello sir uh, sir hello both video and audio is there sir hello there sir hello yes sir मेरा आवाज आ रहा है क्या पे अच्छा ठीक हेलो सर आवाज ये तो है ये पन ये तो है वीडियो पन आए ओके 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 सो दिस इज़ द इफेक्ट ऑफ़ क्रांपल ज़ोन Uh, which we see now when we look at it um, when we are dealing with the patient the most important thing for anything is the history right we have been told right from the third year that history is one of the most important things and that is what uh, dr garde also told you regarding uh, the uh, oroenteral communication and maxillary sinus conditions uh, that even for ankylosis history is very important right so what happens is we have to obtain the mechanism of injury from other observer if it is possible if it is possible huh? what is the time of injury now this time of injury refers to the uh, the golden period and the platinum minutes that if there is extensive trauma we can handle it very well we also have to note for amnesia ent bleed vomiting orientation to time and place because this will tell you whether the patient has suffered a um um whether the patient has suffered a um uh, uh, a head injury right and of course a brief medical history is important so that you know we can institute the proper treatment okay now the first thing that one has to deal with is the primary survey in primary survey um uh, if by that i mean that if me if you are a dental graduate or a post graduate student in maxillary facial surgery one should not rush seeing a frac fracture of the face and try to deal with it there could be some underlying systemic cause that can cause a lot of problems so what we need to do in to check in a primary surveys airway breathing circulation very importantly spine injury abdomen look at the abdomen the chest the cranium and the nerves right and of course the ocular movement these are most integral part or a vital part in primary survey right now what is important in primary survey is the glasgow comma scale now the glasgow comma scale was no, given no, by no, no, no. in genet in the year 1974 and this you can remember by a small mnemonic called as vm that is eye movement verbal response and motor response by which you know their marks assigned points assigned to each particular condition and the best score would be 15 that means the patient has got spontaneous eye movement spontaneous obeying and the patient is oriented okay. however if the there is no response to the eye if there is no response to uh, motor commands to give motor commands and if there is no verbal response then obviously the score is 3 and that is the worst prognosis that a patient can have so you can just remember evm for the glasgow comma scale now glasgow comma scale is not particularly restricted to trauma it can also be used in patients who are moribund patients who got stroke so these are all the situations where we can use the gcs it's very important to know gcs now the next important thing what happens in a motor vehicle accident is a whiplash injury so in whiplash injury what happens is like i told you earlier the patient tends to move forward with the motion of the car and when there sudden deceleration the patient can either head and neck can go forward or it can get hyper extended right hyperflexion or hyper extended so in such a case what can happen is that the cervical vertebrae can get crushed right there can be a ligamentous injury and this is a very critical crucial situation because also when the head if you look here if the head moves forward the brain tends to move backward in a limited space and can cause damage to the brain at the same time when the head moves backward the brain would tend to move forward so one has to be very careful when observing these patients of maxillofacial trauma 
again in primary survey we look for head injury whiplash massive hemorrhage thorax and abdomen cardiac tamponade so on and so forth right these are the most important thing now when we have a patient who is lying on the ground with a motor vehicle accident one should be very careful to transport the patient right there could be a chance unless proven otherwise that the patient is having a cervical fracture so in such a case we need to stabilize the neck and this can now uh, in india unfortunately we are yet to improve our standards to uh, the advanced country standards so normally if an ambulance comes the patient is just shifted now these ambulances in advanced countries would have something called as a lateral stiff, stiff neck which is a semi rigid cervical collar and this allows for temporary immobilization of the cervical spine but since we are known to be to improvise a lot what we do is that we can just put two sandbags and even sandbags is not available we can use rolled up uh, bed sheets or towels and keep it by the side of the neck like this right so this is the simplest thing that one can do if not we if all these facilities are available then we can use this cervical collar now this will prevent the movement of the neck and will be uh, not damaging to the cervical spine now once we have ruled out the cervical spine fractures what we need to do is we need to maintain the airway and by maintaining the airway we can do for maintaining the airway we can do a chin lift that means we cup the forehead of the patient in a c clasp c grip sorry not c clasp c grip and uh, hyper extended at the same time we put our thumb or two fingers below the mentum and pull the mandible forward otherwise what we can also do is to keep four fingers behind the mandible the angle of the mandible and drag it forward so that two things happen first is the moment of the tongue is prevented which goes back at the same time the airway patency is maintained by dragging the mandible up right the other simple thing that one can do is to put these gedels airways right earlier they were made of metal now you got good plastic ones and the way to introduce them is to see that the convexity of this tube matches the convex uh, the uh, sorry the concavity of the tube matches the concavity of the palate and then once it goes in the oropharyngeal region it is turned so that the uh, the tongue doesn't get pushed back by the movement of the airway right so that is the way to do it now if the patient has got an obstruction or if the patient is severely compromised in airway we need to do a tracheostomy and when which are the situations that you can do the tracheostomy when you got a fracture of the cribriform plate that means that there is a extensive head injury right you got uh, the tongue falling back okay so when the tongue is falling back and there's an upper airway obstruction one needs to put a tracheostomy the second thing is the patient could have lot of secretions that will block the airway and also the fact that the patient has got a fracture of the ribs right whereby the patient cannot expand the chest properly so these are all situations where one needs to do a tracheostomy uh now a tracheostomy itself is a big uh discussion which we can do if you do not have a tracheostomy we can just insert a a, a wide bore needle between the thyroid and the cricoid cartilages so that the uh, what is known as cricothyrotomy and this can provide a temporary airway till such time that we manage the patient properly now the secondary survey this cannot begin before the primary survey is done so the primary survey comes consists of airway breathing circulation right if any disability is there and then you have to expose the patient completely okay so when and what are the parts of the secondary survey you need to do what is known as sample now this uh, particular slide you see says ample but you can add an s before it that is symptoms allergies medications past medical history the last meal and the events surrounding the his injury that means what has precipitated that injury that is a big thing because see normally if somebody is riding riding just a cycle falls down then the type of injury which will happen is much lesser than what a patient who is sitting in a car without a restraint uh, and moving very fast can happen right so the secondary survey begins in the sequence of head cervical spine neck chest abdomen perineum rectum now how do you do that you 
uh, wear gloved hands, right? And then uh, you put your gloves on the hands, and then you move your hand in one smooth motion, going back, examining the chest, going at the back, and frequently observing if there is any blood or anything, right? So uh, this is the way one needs to do it. The musculature system. This includes examining the limbs. So when you are examining the leg or the arms, you need to move it in one particular fashion so that you do not miss out any fracture, right? Then after that, you come to the maxillofacial structures and examine it properly. And also, one should look for thermal burns because sometimes you know when you fall off the car, you could get dragged and that can cause a thermal burn also. Okay. Now, what can happen? We come to the proper secondary survey, right? If there is any trauma, we are uh, maxillofacial trauma. There could be mid-face fractures. Then there could be dentoalveolar fractures, and lastly, you got the mandibular fractures. Okay. So first, we'll deal. Uh, uh, we'll go as per what we have talked about, right? So the imaging for trauma is extremely important. You got PA mandible or Waters view. The lateral oblique view of mandible. Now, not not in all centers you are going to have facilities for CT scan. CT scan is the gold standard. If CT scan facility is not available, then one can go in for uh, various uh, you know uh, X-rays. I think Dr. Sharan is going to deal with uh, imaging, right? So you can go with uh, X-rays, and then uh, when the patient is transported to a tertiary care center. you can get a ct scan done now ct scan is there in three sections that is the axial section the uh, coronal section and the sagittal section right so these are the three things which are important and then you got the 3d reformatted images which can tell you a lot of details but however as a purist one should always look for the basic sections of the scan now in a dental college setting or in usually in a dental setting you got the opg which is the best help and it gives you a lot of information like when you observe here there is a fracture of the angle of the mandible right and it has got displaced it's a horizontally unfavorable fracture this is the 3d reconstructed section where you see a fracture of the paracymphysis right so uh, it is needless to say ct scan is the gold standard for your uh, imaging and a viva question that can be asked is the campbell lines and the trapnel lines now the trapnel lines were added at the end which is at the inferior border of the mandible now when you look at these lines just follow them in an x ray and you will come to know which bone has got fractured right this is the significance of campbell and trapnel lines a dentoalveolar fracture we'll deal with it uh, superficially because we've got lot of other things to deal with right it is limited to the teeth and supporting structure of the alveolus causes are traffic accidents falls epileptic seizures sport injuries and even industrial accidents right so this is ls and dewey's classic classification where you got class 1 class 2 class 3 now most of these fractures would be dealt with more in detail in conservative and in uh, pedodontia what is important is that when you got a class 5 fracture over here or something that has got impacted we need to immobilize it right we cannot say that i'll refer you to a pedodontist or a conservative person if you do not if you do not have the facilities of the specialist or a maxillofacial surgeon then one needs to stabilize it and how do you stabilize it i'll just show you there uh, before you stabilize it you do the clinical examination history vitality test and when you see the x ray over here right when you see the x ray over here you can see the fracture of the uh, uh the roots right this is the way you stabilize it use of splints use of arch bars okay or horizontal stabilization now this depends uh, on how much it is acceptable to the patient because sometimes you know the patient who is in a public who is a public figure may not accept this so we can use something called as acid edge composite splinting which is rigid enough but not uh, too good but yes it gives you reasonably good results right otherwise the best way of uh, uh, having a proper dentoalveolar fracture reduced and immobilized is with an arch bar and arch bar is also helpful when you got a fracture of the mandible or the maxilla right so what is the stabilization period for dentoalveolar injury you got the mobile tooth where 7 to 10 days displaced teeth 2 to 3 weeks sorry 
sorry about that displaced teeth 2 to 3 weeks root fracture 2 to 4 months so that means we need that much time to keep the arch bar in place right and of course if there's an alveolar fracture where there's a bony fracture also it is 4 to 6 weeks okay now we come uh, to the mandibular fractures it is said that mandible uh, to the maxillofacial surgeon is like what a canvas is to an artist right so this is the sort of things that you know one uh, we can we are more comfortable working on the mandible right uh, <clears throat> now these are the mandibular fractures that one can appreciate and there is nothing better than a ct scan to give you the best results okay so the classification of fractures the um, now we are dealing we are going to deal with two two classification there are thousands of classifications of fracture of the mandible not just the fracture of the mandible we have fracture of the condyle also right there are so many classification so basically during for the paucity of time we are going to deal with the basic ones that is the dingman and natwix classification which we use it very easily to uh, uh, you know to communicate with other people so you, this is according to the anatomic part okay so you have the condyla process the coronoid the ramus angle body and symphysis it is as simple as that so you can just say the patient has suffered a fracture of the body of the mandible right and of course you got the alveolar fractures or the dento alveolar fractures the second one is the kruger's classification where it is an open open fracture that is compounded now here comes the trick question a uh, examiner would usually ask you have a fracture of the uh, parasymphysis of the mandible in a 21 year old right is it an open fracture or is it a closed fracture you always need to say that it is a compounded fracture or an open fracture because it means it is open to the external environment external what is external environment anything that is outside the uh, soft tissue or the mucosal coverage so if there is a break in the canine region obviously it is got exposed to the oral uh, cavity and the oral fluids right then it can be comminuted where there are more than two fractures green stick where there is one cortex that is fractured usually that is seen in children you got the pathologic fractures because resulting because of uh, any pathology that is there bony pathology where the bone has got very atrophied complex fractures multiple fractures that means more than two bones are involved atrophic fractures you see in the geriatric age group direct fractures if you remember my third slide where there is a blow to the chin and the parasymphysis fractures on one side and the condyle on the other side so what is that called is it is called as a contrecoup fracture right and then lastly you got the impacted fractures impacted fractures are usually seen when the and i'll show you to in my in one of my subsequent slide where it gets pushed upwards or the maxillary segment goes downwards right so the third classification is according to the biomechanics now we call them vertically favorable or unfavorable fractures now unfortunately in the patient you cannot put your head inside but this is the general schematic you even this is according to the muscle pull which is there so you have got when you look from the top and it gets displaced inwards so that is called as unfavorable fracture right similarly according to the pull of the muscle that is the masseter muscle you got a horizontally favorable fracture because this is go opposite to the line of the muscle fibers and it is a horizontally unfavorable fracture if it goes along the uh, fibers of the masseter muscle right now this is what i was talking about impaction right the condyle gets fractured and the mandible tends to the ramus of the mandible gets shortened and accordingly the fulcrum which should be here gets shifted to the molars and when this happens uh, there is a gagging of occlusion or an open bite right so there are two causes of open bite in uh, maxillofacial trauma one is when the condyle gets fractured and second is when the maxilla gets impacted downwards which we'll see later right one very important thing and especially one needs to note this in pediatric fractures is that a high condylar fracture which happens uh, bit, uh, within the capsule of the temporomandibular joint right when there is a fracture what happens is that there is bleeding and when there is bleeding it can undergo uh, remodeling because blood is a pluripotential uh, tissue 
it can undergo after it organizes it can undergo into formation of bone so what happens is that there is a resultant ankylosis especially in a young patient may not happen in an old patient i'll come to the reasons later right it can happen in a young patient and it rapidly undergoes reorganization and ultimately the patient ends up with bony ankylosis and i think dr gard has spoken about it earlier right so this is the slide that i was talking about if there is an adult fracture uh, condyla fracture what happens is that you see that it is usually extra capsular right while in a pediatric patient the periosteum is very thin uh, the cortex is thin and there is a high periosteal activity over here so if there is hemarthrosis obviously it is going to get reorganized and get formed into an ankylotic mass right so this is something that one should keep note especially from the viva point of view the indication for presence of mandibular fracture the patient would have pain now sometimes what happens is that there is a blow uh, whatever because of violence or trauma or whatever right the patient may not notice the fracture right the teeth may occlude properly but what happens is the moment the patient tries to bite the patient gets pain there could be sudden dislocation or malalignment there is numbness because you have the mental nerve which is present over here there could be bleeding with the slide i'll show subsequently swelling in this region and of course there could be dyspnea if it is a bilateral condylar fracture right Uh, sorry uh, uh, parasymp bilateral parasympathetic fracture okay so this is what i was talking about a pathognomic feature of fracture of the mandible in the dentate region is called as the colman sign now why do you see the colman sign the colman sign is because you know the uh, when there is fracture there is bleeding and the tissues in the sublingual region are very lax so what happens is that the rbcs and the blood it tends to flow in that region and can cause a hematoma this is a typical feature which you see over here right there is derangement of occlusion that means the teeth don't intercuspate properly there is a step deformity over here and there is restricted mouth opening restricted mouth opening can happen in cases of fracture of the angle okay so how do you evaluate we uh, evaluate the patient completely right you come to the management part of fractures of the mandible so what what would you want to do okay now basically the first thing is like i said earlier you establish the airway control the hemorrhage if it is there and one thing one should uh, one should keep in mind is that when you get a patient of extensive hemorrhage in the facial region one should not worry too much right you can just put a pressure pack if it is from the fractured bone just try to do a temporary stabilization okay do the suturing of the soft tissues right and then uh, you can manage the patient however if the patient has got some abdominal hemorrhage or thoracic hemorrhage one needs to be very careful stabilize the other injuries evaluation of the uh, damage to the vital structures and then lastly you repair the fractured bone okay so this has to be a perfect balance between form and function now what the patient wants is to there are two things that a patient usually wants the first is the patient gets restored to the pre morbid condition and more importantly that the patient needs to eat mastication right hum kamate kyu hain so that we can eat properly and that is what the patient wants the patient needs to chew on food and that is how we restore the form right so very importantly one can do a reconstruction using the open rigid and internal fixation so what is done for be it a fracture of the mandible or the maxilla the first thing is we need to restore the height the width and the projection these are three things that are very important right so the basic management would be airway i spoke about it circulation pain control soft tissue management if the patient comes i am primary center you need to manage the sutured lacerated wound i recollect an incident when i was in the government dental college and my house officer came and said that she admitted a patient of fracture of the mandible then i said can i see the patient and when i saw the patient i was shocked because this patient was someone who had got hit with a sword by his tenant in the night and what happened was that it had got 
uh, uh, the patient had a major laceration, a very clean laceration from the outer canthus of the eye, splitting the upper lip, splitting the lower lip, and then the mandibular fracture was a very tiny incident over there. So one needs to ev evaluate the patient properly and then do it, right? So then stabilization using intermaxillary fixation, infection control, and antibiotics, okay? So what are the methods of fracture fixation? There are two methods. Earlier, there were three methods. Now, there are two methods. The third method, I'll tell at the end of it, that is, the first one is intermaxillary fixation, IMF, with osteosynthesis. Now, you could also get somebody to ask you, what is MMF? MMF is also the same. That means it says maxillomandibular fixation, right? So, you got intermaxillary fixation or maxillomandibular fixation. You can use eyelet wiring arch bar fixation and IMF screws. Now, what is the basic aim of doing this, right? When the mobility is reduced, right, between the fracture segments, it tends to heal properly, right? The callus is formed, okay? And that will aid in healing of the fractures. So, what we have done over here is to place arch bars so that the fracture remains immobile, right? However, what has happened is that we are living in an age where the patient needs to move around in public, talk a lot, right? And nobody would want to keep his mouth shut for four weeks. Imagine if I am giving a lecture with my teeth closed, obviously you cannot listen to me properly. So this particular thing and um, is outdated. However, it has some use in the first stage of bone plating. Now, why is it outdated is because you will have to keep this intermaxillary fixation in place for at least three to four weeks. And you can imagine what sort of problem the patient would be malnourished at the end of the uh, period where you keep the intermaxillary fixation. So we need to, we have evolved certain treatment, right? Having said that, this is the first stage, even in if you want to do bone plating. So you've got different types of uh, maxillomandibular fixations or intermaxillary fixation. We use the IV eyelet, the Erix arch bar, what we saw earlier. These are the MMF screws or the IMF screws. They can be just inserted without even uh, putting an incision, right? And you got a temporary stabilization using brittle wire, okay? Now, unfortunately, the patient also demands that you need to mobilize the jaws early. So that means we have done away with it. We are dealing with uh, in, uh, osteosynthesis without IMF, okay? There could be a situation where there is a tooth, impacted tooth within the angle fracture. Now, the question that might be asked you is, do you remove it or do you keep it in place? The answer would be that there are absolute and relative contraindications of removal, right? If this tooth does not, if the tooth is normal, right, does not allow the mobility of the fractures, right, aids in retaining the fracture segments, then we keep the tooth. If at all that the tooth gets fractured or if there is infection, if there's periapical infection, if there's periodontal infection, then obviously the tooth has to go for extraction. So these are the sort of situations that one needs to deal with it. So in, in a nutshell, if we look at it, what are the different types of reductions? You've got close reduction where you, the indications are undisplaced favorable fractures. Pediatric fractures, pediatric fractures, I'll come to it later. You cannot put screws because there are developing teeth burn. Grossly comminuted fractures, coronite fractures, coronite fractures, if they happen, they need not be reduced because it gets pulled upwards. It has got very little uh, uh, indication for uh, reduction. A high level condyle fracture, that means something that happens within the capsule of the condyle where we need to mobilize it, otherwise there is ankylosis. The contraindication to close reduction would be severe asthma, severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, poorly controlled seizures. Imagine if there's a patient of seizure and the patient is put on intermaxillary fixation for four weeks, the patient could aspirate and die, right? Or those patients who got psychiatric and neurologic disorders or patients with severe nausea and eating disorders. So in such cases, we cannot do a close reduction and we need to do an open reduction, which is known as in, uh, intermax, uh, sorry, osteosynthesis without IMF. So what are the indications? You got the displaced unfavorable fractures, 
atrophic mandibular fractures, complex facial fractures, and subcondylar fractures. So that means within the capsule, we will exercise restraint. Something that is outside the capsule or in the neck of the condyle, we can always do a uh, an open reduction. The contraindications are very little, right? Uh, in such cases, because like I said earlier, one cannot put screws in pediatric patients because it will damage the permanent teeth bud, right? So open reduction would involve reduction, fixation, and uh, plate osteotin. Now, what one question that is usually asked is what is reduction? By reduction, we mean the anatomic realignment of the fracture segments, right? Now, once you've got the anatomic, uh, the fractures reduced, you can do the fixation using intermaxillary fixation or bone plates, right? And then you need to immobilize it by using plate osteosynthesis. When we are using only intermaxillary fixation, we are reducing the fractures by getting them in occlusion, right? So occlusion is the best form of reduction. And then we can go for either uh, plate osteosynthesis or if the patient is not a candidate for open reduction, we can do with intermaxillary fixation. So we, this is open reduction with internal fixation. So this is also known as osteosynthesis without IMF. Here we use mini plates and screws. These are the mini plates, right? And these are the different screws that you see over here. Now, when this happens, the fracture is rigidly held. Now you may, you may say, you may ask me that why is it that we still see the arch bar over here? Because the arch bar was placed to get the teeth in occlusion. And you know, why does the, uh, why does the M uh, BDS take four years and, and MDS take three more years? That is because we are told about the importance of occlusion. There are other people also do it. I'm not going to blame anybody, any other specialty. But there are other people from other faculties who try to do it. And then the job is not as good because... Nobody knows occlusion better than dental surgeons, right? So that is the importance. Now, how do you put the plates in the mandible? Okay. So Champy in the year 1973, he was a French maxillofacial surgeon. He did experimental studies. And what he observed was that on the alveolar side, right, there is tension. If you look at a fracture, right, the fracture tends to open near the, uh, the teeth part, right? And... On the lower part, that is the inferior border, there is compression. Okay. So what he designed was on an experimental model, he designed what is known as the Champy's lines of osteosynthesis. So there was one line which is just medial to the external oblique ridge. And when you place it over here, you can reduce the fractures of the angle. If there is a fracture in the intercanine region, right, you need to put two plates. Why is two plates. Simple question that could be asked. The torsional forces that happen in the intercanine region are about 120 newtons, while each plate, titanium plate, can withstand a torsion of uh, uh, 60 newtons. So when you add two plates, the torsional forces are reduced and that can cause uh, better stability to the fracture segments, right? These are some fractures that we have dealt with in our department, right? So you have a fracture of the angle, you got a fracture of the parasymphysis, and this is what we did. Apart from that, of course, the patient had some uh, mid-phase fractures, that is of the FZ region, the intravital region. So now if you see over here, we have exposed the fracture line intraorally, and we have put two plates over here, right? Because this is the intercanine region. Now this will prevent the torsion. If you see over here, this is the angle region, Just I'll just show the x-ray again. This is the angle fracture, right? So when you have an angle fracture, we have reduced it intraorally and we've just put one plate. The beauty about all these surgeries are that unless it is grossly displaced or if the patient has got an extensive laceration, only in those cases, we need to open it extraorally. Otherwise, most of the fractures can be dealt intraorally, which is a very good thing for uh, young patients also, right? This is a post-op X-ray. Where do you see? You, see, you can see the plates over here on the mandible, right? So this is the sort of reduction that we get, which is very good, okay? Now we come to the last part, that is the mid-phase fractures, okay? So the mid-phase is basically, you have the central mid-phase and the lateral mid-phase. Now the central mid-phase would be the tooth-bearing part, that is the uh, 
uh, you have the maxilla, right? <coughs> and it's uh, where it unites with the cranium and you got the zygoma, okay? A zygoma is a very sturdy bone and usually the zygoma itself doesn't get fractured. Let it get fractured at the sutural part, okay? Now, what is the physiology of these fractures, right? The facial structure has got a lot of buttresses. Now, wh what are these buttresses? These are the struts where you have the various forces that get transmitted, okay? Now, this transmission can happen during the time of mastication or during any parafunctional load that happens. So, usually what happens is that the fractures also happen along the same struts, okay? So, what are the fractures of the mid phase that involve the occlusion? So, you've got dental fractures, subzygomatic and suprazygomatic fractures. The Supra, the subzygomatic fractures include LIFO1 and LIFO2. We'll deal about it in just a little while. And then you got LIFO3, which is the high level or craniofacial disjunction. Right? So this <clears throat> René Lefort was, uh, I, he was a scientist and he in 1901, that means 120 years back, he did experimental studies on cadavers where he hit the face with a bat. Right, and he observed various fracture lines subsequently. So you have one fracture that passes from the piriform aperture, right, going backwards and fracturing the pterygoid plate at the uh, <clears throat> upper level. You got the uh, LIFO2 fracture, right, and then you got the LIFO3 fracture, which starts from the uh, nasal fr the frontonasal junction, uh, foramen, uh, the union, fracturing the ethmoid, sphenoid and then the zygoma, right? What you observe over here, right? It can be observed in this particular slide even better. So this is called a floating maxilla, okay? It's also called as a Guerin fracture, right? So this is the extent that you can see over here where the pterygoids get fractured at a lower level. Then you have the pyramidal fracture, which is the LIFO2 fracture. Now, the common thing about LIFOT 1 and 2 is that they're subzygomatic fractures, right? And what you observe is usually with any LIFOT fracture, there's going to be a disturbance in the occlusion, right? And LIFOT 3 is the highest level of mid-face injury, which is called as the craniofacial disjunction. So you can see what is the extent of injury, how severely the face has got fractured. Now, one thing which I must tell you over here that the rule of the thumb is that it Usually patients don't come, patients are not cadavers, right? So the fracture can happen anywhere. It is not a typical fracture that you get to see in all patients. There can be a combination of LIFO2 and a LIFO3 or a LIFO1 on one side and a LIFO2 on the other side. So it can just be a combination because when he studied, it was on cadavers, but the patients who meet with accidents are not cadavers, right? So these are the clinical features of mid-phase fractures, right? You got... <coughs> You got edema, there's facial asymmetry. And usually if you see this particular this particular image, you'll find that the face has got elongated. Why does it get elongated? Because the maxilla tends to get pushed backwards. And when it gets pushed backwards, the, uh, the molars, they come in premature contact and that can cause elongation of the face, right? The second important point is when you observe a patient of leaf fracture, fractures, you have to do a percussion of the teeth. When you percuss the teeth, there is a dull sound which is produced, right? Something, you know, when you go to buy some cups from a crockery shop and the, uh, the, the salesman uses the spoon to sound those cups and if there's a fracture in any cup or if the cup is cracked, then obviously there'll be a dull sound, right? The second thing is that the palate gets pushed backwards causing airway embarrassment. This is the premature occlusion that I was talking about leading to a... Uh, an increased facial dimension. There could be a raccoon's eye sign, okay, which is there because this is bilateral ecchymosis, what you see over here. Another sign which I cannot show over here is called as the battle sign. Now, this battle sign happens when there is a, a fracture of the middle cranial fossa. Now, this can happen either because of a LIFO3 fracture or because of an anterior cranial fossa fracture. Another important thing which usually happens with a LIFO3 or a LIFO2 is that there could be fracture to the cribriform plate and this leads to CSF rhinorrhea because the 
meninges have got torn. A similar thing can happen when there is fluid coming out of the ears that is called as otorrhea, right? It cannot be, it need not be always otorrhea. It can also be something that has got to do with the fracture of the condyle leading to a, a, a hemorrhage from the ear, right? And this is the gag occlusion which you see on the lower right side, okay? Unlike the mandible where you can palpate the lower border to find if there is any defect, right? For the maxilla, you cannot palpate over here and find if there's any step deformity. So what you need to do is you need to run your fingers, your gloved fingers, right? On the infraorbital rim, the supraorbital rim, right? To observe if there is any step deformity. And also you need to palp push your finger inside the uh, upper vestibule to find if there is any fracture of the zygomatic buttress, right? So this is an indication that there could be a mid-phase fracture, right? So the treatment part is you have open and closed, something similar to the, uh, <clears throat> the mandibular treatment. The only difference here is that just IMF will not help. Why? The IMF is not going to help alone because the mandible is a mobile jaw. When you do a IMF for the mandible, it is fixed to the cranial uh, structures, which is immobile. But if you try to fix the mandible to the maxilla, then it is difficult. The bone will never get healed. It will never get united because the mandible is a mobile jaw, right? So that will tend to keep moving and there will be always non-union. The earlier, there were reports, I mean, we used to do wiring and all, but that has totally gone away. So basically, we resort to plates and screws. It is my humble appeal to all the students that please, whenever you are asked a question, the historically, you can mention about fix suspensions and external fixation. Normally, we do internal fixation, and that is the best way to reduce the fractures of the man uh, of the mid face, right? Now, these are the rose disimpaction forceps. Like when you saw that image, when the maxilla goes backwards, right? You have the rose disimpaction forceps, and you you stand at the back of the patient. Now, one thing. This is from one of the most reputed, uh, you know, organizations that gives us all guidelines. Unfortunately, there is something wrong with this image. You have to stand at the back of the patient when you're trying to pull the maxilla. Because what happens is that if you're standing in front, you're putting all your pressure and ultimately you'll end up with a maxilla in your hand. So what you should do is you should stand at the back of the patient, right? Put the forceps in the nose and the palate and then gradually move it upwards, right? So this will be the best way to disimpact the maxilla, right? Now, what are the different methods of uh, open reduction? So you got the vestibular approach, right? Where you can do the plating over here, right? This is the best way to do it. And you can put different plates in different regions. Now, unfortunately, uh, I think each, the fracture of mandible, the fracture of midface, itself is about four lectures each. I'm trying to do justice in one hour. Okay. These are the different points. You can use existing lacerations, right? You can use something called as a coronal approach. That is you go through the scalp and expose the skull and do the plating at different parts, right? So these are the different spots where you can put the bone plates, frontozygomatic, zygomatico-temporal, nasofrontal, right? Then this at the buttress region, the zygomatico maxillary region. This is plating the infraorbital rim. Okay. So one needs to be <clears throat> very judicious when using the incisions. There are different incisions, which we'll talk sometime later if given a chance. Okay. Now, the last part is the zygomatic. Now, as I said earlier, it's a very strong bone. However, it rests on fragile support, right? So it is, and one important thing that you should realize is that it's not a tripod fracture, it's a tetrapod fracture. That means there are four legs, right? These are the four legs on which the zygoma rests, okay? So the clinical signs and symptoms would be the flattening of the zygomatic uh, prominence, periorbital ecchymosis, pain, there's buccal swelling, there could be epistaxis, okay? There's diplopia. Now, why is there diplopia? Because sometimes the floor of the orbit gets fractured and the eyeball gets herniated into the sinus. We'll see that in the subsequent slide. There could be impaired vision, 
the mouth opening is restricted now why is the mouth opening restricted because when the zygoma gets pulled downwards the coronoid is prevented from translating forward okay the different approaches the classical approach was the gillies temporal approach which is at 45 degrees angle to the zygoma this was described by sir herald gillies right and the plane you enter is between the temporal fascia and the temporalis muscle where you insert the now it is the rose uh, disimpaction forceps this gives a greater control you know it looks like like a huge scissor the earlier bristow's elevator was just one flat blade and the problem used to be that you know when you elevate it it used to rest on the parietal bone and the parietal bone get get fractured so you got the rose elevator now this rose elevator gives you control over the motion right the second one is the intraoral approach the keens approach okay where you insert an instrument in the buccal vestibule and tend to pull the maxilla uh, sorry the zygoma forwards okay the percutaneous approach you can just put a small screw you need not even incise you can put a screw and then tend to drag the zygoma outwards the best way a percutaneous technique would be a carol girard screw now this is one which looks like a very sophisticated hammer but it has got a long arm which you see over here now this particular working end with the screw will go inside and engage the zygoma and you can have greater control over the pull okay mm. the rigid dental fixation like i said earlier can be at three points you need to have at least three point fixation right and if there is a fracture of the floor of the orbit you can use either a calvarial bone and if the patient is not willing one can use a titanium mesh or a proline mesh so that the volume of the orbit gets retained properly right now this is the blow or fracture that i was talking about this results because of a blow and what ultimately happens is that the orbital contents the orbital floor gets fractured and the orbital contents tend to hernia so the aim of the uh, ma the management is that we have to restore the orbital volume now if you compare these two orbits you will find that the volume has increased over here and because the volume of the orbit has increased there is the sinking of the eye in the maxillary sinus so when you put this mesh over here uh, either a titanium mesh or a proline mesh you are restoring the orbital volume thereby restoring the eye to its normal level now a viva point of question if at all you are asked uh, you know CT, shown a ct scan now these are the different extra ocular eye muscles which you see right these are the four extra ocular eye muscles which you can see pediatric fractures they are challenging right one very important thing which you should know here is that the child is not a uh, a young adult you know it's not a, a reduced version of an adult they are dif they are not different species but the anatomy tends to be slightly different now there are developing sinuses and teeth buds so that is why i said that you cannot put a bone plate in a pediatric fracture so if you see this image this was by a uh, webinar by andrew hege right and this shows how the cranium the facial skeleton grows so when you see here the cranium is very large the jaws are very small and as the child grows and at the adult stage the cranial and the facial volume is 2.5 is to 1 okay this is the technique of circumambular wiring because you cannot usually use i am not saying you cannot always use but you cannot usually use bone plates because you have got the developing teeth buds which are present over here so what you need to do is you can just create the splint refracture the uh, cast adapt the acrylic and then you can put the uh, a splint over here and retain it with the wire through a, what is known as the obliquus circumambular wire soft tissue injuries one should not get scared right one very important thing to notice that if we get the bone back that the soft tissue would automatically be restored in the proper way right so this is something that uh, you know one should always keep in mind but don't rush to correct the soft tissues okay and then forget about the bone so the general complications would be infection of the fracture site loose hardware what is loose hardware you got the plates and screws there could be malunion there could be non union 
Now, malunion can ha happen in cases of uh, either the mandible or the maxilla, but more common in the maxilla, right? Because we do not realize it. Non-union happens in cases of mandibular fractures because that would tend to keep moving. Okay. There is ankylosis in case of condylar fractures and there could be nerve injury in extensive injuries, right? So the aftercare is that whenever you're dealing with a patient of maxillofacial trauma, the patient should be kept propped up in the post-operative phase at an, in the bed with an angle of 30 degrees so that the lymphatic movement gets, uh, it moves properly downwards and there is no obstruction there, right? The follow-up is that the facial deformity should be kept under observation because sometimes it is difficult. We have a case who is a 13-year-old girl and we have, she met, uh, she went and hit a tractor, right? The facial injuries were so much that, you know, we have told her that you need to come back for some certain revisions. Okay. The problems of dentition and dental sensation, problems of occlusion and temporomandibular joint, right? Either it can be because of the ankylosis, okay, or pain. The future is bioresorbable plates. Now, these are some plates which can be used for the pediatric patients. They are made of polyl lactic acid and... Uh, one thing to note is that they're very expensive. Now, what happens is that these plates, they very gradually undergo resorption and the patient does not need to have a secondary surgery. Now, this is something uh, which you ought to know, right? This is something very desirable that you should know is virtual planning, where nowadays we do <coughs> a, a 3D uh, model printing and then in extensive injuries, we can replicate that with the normal unaffected side so that the patient gets the best results, right? So thank you so much. I hope uh, my lecture was of some use to you and you can always view it at leisure also. Thank you, Boyer, sir, for this opportunity and thank you, MHS, again for nominating me as a speaker for this very prestigious event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanai, sir. It was... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. It was excellent presentation on uh, maxillofacial injuries. Thank you, sir. You have included uh, not only uh, the facial injury, that is the practice of the mandible and the practice of the mid-facial skeleton. Yes, sir. But also, we have covered up the assessment of the uh, neurological injuries, head injuries, brain injuries, cervical spine injuries, and the injuries of the other body parts of the vital parts of the body. Thank all you, the sir. aspect, all the aspects of the uh, treatment modality has been discussed, uh, elaborated.